Welcome to the Bird Barrier Live Training. My name is Michael Gallion, and we are going to be talking about swallows, the unique characteristics of swallows. Now, before we get started with swallows, there was a question that came up about optical gel or Optica for Canada uh, as being the best solution to the problem. Now, we're going to talk about optical gel and Optica in relation to swallows coming up. But in regard to woodpeckers, which was a previous session, you know, is it the best solution for the problem? Many times optical gel can be a great solution for woodpeckers and also mud swallows, but there's no guarantee on any job what the exact best solution is until we evaluate it, you know, so uh, most of the time it is. And I, for people just getting started in bird control, this can be a great tool to use. But until we see the, uh, the pictures and we understand the measurements and the structure, uh, you know, one of the deterrents that we have may be better suited than optical gel. We just don't know until we see it. But I would say, as a general rule right now, uh, about 90% of, of uh, you know, woodpecker jobs can be solved with optical gel successfully and profitably. And, effectively for the customer. Now let's talk about mud swallows. Mud swallows equally uh, quirky and unusual compared to other birds like the way the woodpeckers are. They have their own set of really unique uh, characteristics. These are very protected birds. We're going to cover that, but this is the bird in which the entire Migratory Bird Act came into existence from, you know, it was based on protecting these birds first because they're the migratory nature and how much impact they have on the whole cycle, uh, the ecosystem. A few points about the bird biology itself. Sometimes it can be hard to figure out that you're actually dealing with swallows. They certainly, their traces of nesting and the way that they use mud, there makes it no doubt about it. When you see the birds up close in that environment, you have no doubt that you're dealing with mud swallows. But away from their nest, they can be kind of confusing. They get confused with other birds. The, the way that they dart around and fly, I, I can immediately recognize them because I've worked around these birds for so long. But um, they come in a lot of different uh, shapes and sizes, and they can really blend in with other bird species. So you really have to see them in the act up close to know what species you're dealing with. Let's take a quick look at a, an example of swallows coming in, in, into human situations. When humans were cave dwellers, so were barn swallows. Once we learned how to build permanent structures, our numbers grew and eventually exploded and the barn swallows couldn't be more pleased to take advantage of the boom. These days, it's virtually impossible to find them nesting in such primitive places as caves and cliff faces. Our structures offer the perfect perpendicular intersection that makes building nests with twigs and mud a more predictable undertaking than getting mud to adhere firmly on the irregular surface of a cliff wall. Using about a thousand mud pellets, they create structures that curve outward, upward, and around. Unlike most birds, they reuse their nests. But they're like adobe homes, permanent. The barn swallow, cobalt blue on top and cinnamon on the underparts, is the only North American swallow with a forked tail. The inside of that V is edged with a string of pearls. Females have lighter breasts, sometimes almost white. Barn swallows sweep low and fast over fields and water, ping-ponging in crazy loops that make filming them in flight nearly impossible. They look for human structures near those fields full of bugs or near water teeming with insects. Then they build their nests, say, inside a barn, thus their name, or under eaves, or even beneath highway overpasses. We landlords love hate them. 
Well, they're beautiful, and their flight is beguiling. But they are not tidy tenants. Oh, the nests are clean, all right. But the birds drop mud and twigs and jettison white balloons of feces nearby. If the nest is under your porch, <clears throat> yuck. A broken washing machine in the yard would at least be cleaner. The swallows match our love-hate with their own. They put up with us for the sake of walls with regular angles, but they resent us. They fuss and fly at human intruders coming close enough that you can feel the air pumping through their feathers, sometimes close enough to part the hair on a bald man's head. They've never heard of deeds or mortgages. They just know it's their territory now, and they'd prefer if we simply built the structures and moved on. The great egret is commonly credited with the birth of the conservation movement. But actually, the barn swallow was the impetus. George Bird Grinnell wrote an essay in 1886 condemning the use of barn swallow feathers in ladies' hats. And the resulting indignation among his readers led to the founding of the first Audubon Society chapter. Thank you, Mr. Grinnell. Okay, so there you go. There's uh, kind of a typical sort of situation that you'll, you'll see. Let's talk about the nest itself here. I've got a photo of the nest, you know, up close. Now, a barn swallow nest is very similar to your general uh, cliff swallow where the nest is made out of the same kind of mud pellets, but on a barn swallow, it just has an open top and kind of shaped like a traditional nest where you go in and out of the uh, top. One of the reasons why the cliff swallow has a completely encapsulated nest with just a simple hole is that they control the temperature of the interior of their nest. And that's a big part of it. Uh, they will actually close the hole uh, on that nest to keep more heat inside or break it open, you know, open things up a little more to allow more ventilation of the heat, and that controls the temperature inside in the incubation process of the birds themselves, so the offspring. Um, they're, as I mentioned, they're very protected. In, in North America, you wanna wait until October 1st before you do anything. By then, these birds have vacated and the entire colony is migrating to the Southern Hemisphere, and that's pretty much how they, they survive. They constantly go through two cycles of spring each year and offspring each time that they show up, you know, and they're, they're timing it just right so they have a huge amount of food and supplies for making a good, uh, successful uh, breeding uh, season. Don't harm them in any way. Don't interfere with the nest. Don't touch the nest. Uh, they, they definitely stain structures and can spread disease. So this is one of the important factors that come in in you explaining to your customers there are some risk involved. Of course, somewhere near that nesting area is going to be a water source for them to be able to make the mud pellets that they use. Where they uh, get to their nesting and it begins, you'll start seeing a lot of droppings that fall from the birds going in and out and of course uh, just the the nature of how localized their nesting spot is so they can really do a number on a facility They have one of the strongest nesting reclaim uh, Even more than just about any other bird in that they travel halfway around the world and then they will come back half a year later with the hopes of going right back to the nest they created so the very specific mating family that is part of that one nest will come right back. So it's the exact same set of birds that are going to try to reuse that nesting area. So there's a lot of biology going on. So their ability to smell and identify pheromone imprint on that building is really severe. 
That imprinting uh, is what resident birds are all about. They mark it and that's their place where they live. So the cleanup process should be a lot more than just knocking down the nest and washing off, spraying it off some of the mud. One of the mistakes we see is you will see the mud ring imprint on the building left, even behind netting or whatever your, your solution is. And that's a really bad idea. You wanna kill all of that imprint. You wanna clean it thoroughly. And that is part of the solution. Up to seven offspring for each nest. Uh, 24 days, they typically fledge, but they remain. So as they fledge, they're going to continue to come back to the area and be part of the process of going out and getting food, insects, and then storing up as much energy for this long journey here from North America down, all the way down to South America. Here's an example of their migratory path of what's going on, the, the mass migration that occurs with these type of birds. They're going all the way down and then they're following themselves all the way back. Now, the different colors and the different flyways are based on weather patterns. Obviously, uh, the further north you go, the later things sort of happen. So where we start seeing birds now here in Southern California, uh, only about maybe one month from now, we will start seeing the return of mud swallows in Southern California. It will be about a month later where we start hearing about them arriving in Colorado. And then a month later to Southern areas of Canada. And that all has to do with, you know, the, the way that plants start to come back and all the plant and insect life starts happening. You don't want to trap these birds. It will serve no purpose whatsoever, and you'll get yourself in a ton of trouble. The key to solving these, like many other birds, is relocation. And when you're thinking about relocation, the whole thing is that you have to view the entire colony as your strategy. To get a section of these birds to no longer nest on the building means that the rest of them are going to continue to nest on that building. And by the time they have offspring, the numbers are gonna outweigh any of this like partial treatment plan that you're gonna do. When we say relocation, your strategy should be to get the entire colony, when they come back in the spring, to not want anything to do with this nesting colony that they've created, and they will go somewhere else. Now these birds have the natural instinct as part of their biology to have a backup place already chosen. So when, like for this, this photo that I have here of this uh, Valencia County building, the birds that are residents there had a secondary place that they already had marked and there were probably some uh, partial nest even created on that secondary place. And if something should happen to this nesting colony after they're coming all these thousands of miles, They'll make the switch, and that's one of the really cool things about solving these birds is that you can see the swarm coming into a building in the spring. And if you do the right things, all of a sudden, overnight, all the birds will be gone. They've made the decision as a group to move somewhere else and do their nesting. And that's always your goal to see that happen. Now, a year later, they're probably going to go back to the secondary position that they created as a result of being excluded, but not always. Sometimes they'll re-explore, but usually by the second year, whatever exclusion you've done to get them to move elsewhere can be taken down, actually, and they'll, they'll move on. So this is where, if you are using netting or some other solutions, you want to think uh, in terms of two seasons. By the second season afterwards, two years later, they're probably going to not be coming back to that property if you've done it right. A lot of people don't know this, but the birds are, are drawn to shade. And if you think about the mud nest that they build, if they get direct sunlight, they're gonna crack and they're gonna fall apart. So that's part of the strategy of why they build where they build. So when you take your photos, make sure you get the photo of the building where they're nesting and anything else along with that building. We see here in this photo behind that they found great places 
to build in the shade, not just in those square cavities to the left, but on above the doors and other areas, even down lower. It's all about staying in the shade and being able to have structures that will survive. We need measurements. We need the Google address. We want to look around the property. We want to look at uh, where are they collecting their mud. Sometimes doing some kind of deterrent system on the side of the property that represents their access to mud. You know, what direction are they constantly coming from? Is there a lake a half a mile away to the east? We need to know things like that that comes into play. Here are deterrents that are typically used for mud swallows. Now, I mentioned optical gel. We can talk a little more about, you know, how this is done. But with this particular photo, you can get, you see the idea there. Uh, there's a mud swallow that was a nest above in a corner. And the second half, lower half, shows how the discs were put in there. Now you notice in the stucco there's no trace of that mud nest that existed before. You have to clean it very well, right? We want to see it look very clean and then you add these discs in. If they're corner nest and they've only built in corners, then you only want to treat corners. You don't necessarily have to treat all of the, uh, these uh, places where the wall meets the ceiling. You just have to look at what they're doing. For more information on our, on our website, for under optical gel, you'll see the treatment guide that's specific to that bird. So go to our website for the, to be able to download these uh, little treatment uh, sheets. PVC mesh is a good tool uh, that can be used for mud swallows. Sometimes, Shock systems can be a good solution. Uh, you have to be careful with that because you have to consider how much shade. If we take and put this along the corner where the wall meets the ceiling and there's enough traction of that stucco below, they'll just move below. So you have to be very careful. You don't want to go through and install all that and have it fail. Same thing with bird slide. Bird slide can be put up in the, to that that uh, corner where the wall meets the ceiling, but you have to know where is the shadow in. And if you only put a cover just that corner where they were nesting, but they can still go below the bird slide and be in the shade, this could be a complete waste of time. So you have to use some strategy when it comes to installing things like the bird slide we can see right here. Stealth net, of course, that's another opportunity to solve uh, mud swallows. Here we see on a house where they were under this eave and just put the net down at a 45 degree angle. You don't ever just go straight under at a right angle to the wall. We want to come down at a 45 degree angle to push the birds out into the sunlight areas. That's the strategy with stealth net. Those are the bullet points of mud swallows and of course the basics about treating them. Again, we're, we're going to open it up to Q&A. If somebody has something they want to discuss as well, uh, feel free to let me know and we can unmute you. But for now, I'm going to look for questions in the chat box. Um, I'm really curious about uh, the, the crowd out there, how many people have actually done any mud swallow jobs. In the chat box, Type in there if you've actually had an opportunity to treat mud swallows. And then also indicate how you treated them. Let's see, uh, Matt says, we do swallows each uh, year and use netting every time. How did they get the 40 to 5 degree angle with the netting? So uh, that 45 degree angle uh, just is more about the specifics of sunlight, but that's the standard. Uh, that was... The formula that was developed years ago uh, for bird barrier, probably over 20 years ago. And the other thing about this type of net that you see, uh, by using turnbuckles on every corner, and then of course using the multi-purpose cable bracket in a certain configuration, this net can be removable. You know, a person that owns a house, they're glad to get rid of the birds for that season. And it's nice to be able to remove that net uh, for uh, half of the year and put it back up again when needed. 
and then eventually just get rid of it altogether. It's not really the best thing to have that permanent structure up there, but depending on uh, businesses, they're usually more uh, le less uh, sensitive to the aesthetic. Uh, see, Bobby says, yes, in country home settings, he's treated mud swallows. Homes can uh, be, you know, a, a good motivated customer. It's terrible if you have a home that gets infested with these. It's, uh, you know, the one other thing that I've noticed with homes is you tend to get uh, bird bugs from mud swallows. Now, not bed bugs, but we're talking bird bugs, but they, they're very similar to uh, bed bugs, and they, and they can get into the home as well. Uh, let's see, Andy says he, we do cliff swallow jobs. I've used optical gel and bird slide, very good. So we've got people that have actually worked with these birds. I mean, they're amazing to watch. Uh, it's a really amazing thing to watch them uh, build the nest, how fast they can go up. Let's see, the other question, do you have anything, do you do anything on grackles? <laughs> Grackles, uh, I think, uh, yes, we, we're going to be touching on grackles, and, and that would be Cameron. Uh, Cameron Riddell, the president of Bird Barrier, I think next week is doing a special class on outdoor dining areas. Now, if you haven't signed up for that, uh, this is a tough area of bird control is outdoor areas of, of restaurants. And the reason why I mentioned that when he, when Micah, you mentioned grackles, that's one of the most, uh, the only places where I really see grackles in bird control, they always seem to be uh, an issue with outdoor eating or outdoor restaurant retail areas. Is that the case for you, Micah? In your chat box, go ahead and type in there what, you know, I'm curious why you ask about grackles. Um, yeah, mud swallows, are they a protected species? Uh, Sean Close asked that question. And I'll let somebody else answer that. I covered it earlier. That's a good question. Uh, so Micah says, awesome, we have tons here in Texas. Yeah, I even told Cameron, I said, we got, we've got a lot of customers in Texas that deal with these grackles, and it's usually restaurant or mall areas where, you know, human activity, and they're a pain. The problem with grackles is they do not, they do not nest on a structure like mud swallows or woodpecker. They nest in the trees and they'll stay at the trees. So part of the solution has to do with those. Yeah, and Tyler is correct. Migratory Bird Convention Act is the basis for mud swallow protection. So to answer the question earlier, are they a protected species? They are the what I'll say the most protected. As a matter of fact, let's go back to one of these mud nests. I'm going to go back to the slide here. See this picture of this mud swallow nest? Who can tell me how much the fine maximum is if you remove one of those while they're active? What's the most you can get fined on one nest? And uh, for those of you who have taken them down innocently before, you're going to be very happy to know you dodged a very serious bullet. Anybody have any idea how much that is? If Fish and Game sees you taking down one of those mud nests during nesting, anybody have a guess? I'm going to give it about five more seconds. $10,000 is the correct answer. Prices $10,000 per nest. So what if you had a hundred nests that you just took down and fish and game comes walking up to you? You might be out of business. <laughs> all birds, see Andy says, all birds are protected under the North America Migratory Bird Act except pigeons, house sparrows, and starlings. Right, and, uh, and he even mentions other non-native invasive species. So when the COVID is over, one of the non-native invasive species that's come into play, believe it or not, is parrots. Believe it or not, parrots, like South American parrots. And they are actually uh, creating problems for the power industry. They build these massive apartment complex nests that weigh up to 800 pounds around telephone poles. And they hold in the heat so well because these are tropical birds, they need to have heat. In places like New York, 
They build nests around telephone pole transformers for the heat. They do such a good job of insulating heat, the whole thing catches fire and the whole thing explodes and 40,000 people are without service in Long Island, New York. So that's one of my uh, next assignments is we're gonna be working to solve that problem for the power industry and uh, they've invited me out there as soon as COVID clears up. So that covers everything I think as far as the mud swallows. I'm gonna show you, actually I've got a, an example here that I want to show people. Rotate your phone. Hold on, just uh, rotate my phone. Yep. Let's see, this was a different one. I had, let me see if I can, before you broadcast this, uh, Zach, hold on just a second here. Um, I got to get to my camera roll. I'm going to show you a cool video here in a second. One thing I'll mention about this, this crew on this site, that's really, really cool. Let's see here, here we go. So, let's see here. Let's see here, we've got, you guys can see this okay? So here is a, here is a, a place where there were mud swallows and you see that the solution here was netting. Now if I zoom in there you can see this is the ring that I was warning about. You don't want to leave that sort of ring up in there because that's got a lot of pheromone draw and the resident bird that once lived here when they get back they'll tend to stay around this area more than they would have had it been cleaned really thoroughly and properly. But uh, you see the idea here on the lower ones, they use stone netting uh, to solve this problem. And here's an example of where optical gel was used on an area down below when uh, the birds moved. So sometimes when we net, we net off a job and then the birds come back the, in the spring, they'll start going to other areas and this is a great way to thwart uh, like a temporary uh, uprising of the of the return of the birds using uh, using the optical gel for that. We can see this is through the window inside of, of a nest up above that looked like that so you can just see how much how much of a mess is made there. Um, here's some video of what this stuff really looks like. This is what a really bad mud swallow infestation can look like. So Hopefully this has been helpful uh, to everyone out there. Let me know if there are any other questions I see on our chat box. I think we've, we've cover, covered everything. Uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we're covering two more birds. Uh, this will be starlings, which some, you know, uh, Andy mentioned, that's one of the not protected birds as well as mud swallows, I mean uh, sparrows. So tomorrow we're talking about two more birds that are, are not protected, but are very common invasive species. So uh, we thank everyone for joining us here. Again, my name is Michael Gallion, and we will see you at the next webcast. Thank you.